Hello and welcome yeah. to everybody. I want to start with a few small and not insignificant factoids about my three guests. Tori Birch is the second youngest self-made millionaire woman in the world. Mon <laughs> Monona Blahnik was the first man ever to appear on the cover of UK Vogue with Angelica Houston. <laughs> looking impossibly glamorous. <laughs> and the Missonis were the first fashion house ever to be given an exhibition at the Whitney Museum in New York. I think the only thing that they all have in common, apart from their incredible success and their enormous talent, is that all three of you have had the most incredible childhood. So I want to start with Tori because... Is that? Yeah, that's doing it. Um, Tori, your parents, your father dated um, Grace Kelly and your, uh, and your mother dated Steve McQueen. Oh. So that's a pretty oh. auspicious beginning. I, I haven't lived up to it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have. So when you were growing up as a child, were you aware that your parents were glamorous, did that first ignite your interest in style and glamour? I don't, I don't think I was that aware. We, they intentionally moved out in, on a farm basically in the middle of nowhere because they really wanted to give us a more wholesome childhood and it was really about family and being outside and sports. That said, they were always dressed beautifully, so I always looked at them as being very glamorous, but I was more of a tomboy myself. I heard that. I heard that you were very much of a tomboy until you got your prom dress, which I think was <laughs> San Luo. And that was a big that was a big deal and I that was my first dress, but I think I was seventeen at the time. So until then I was, it was hard for me to put on a dress. I was always interested in tennis and riding and So fashion really wasn't you know, wasn't in your DNA at that time. It might have been in my DNA through my parents. I think my dad should have been a designer. He designed all of his clothing. And, and I heard he lined his suits in Hermes scarves. He did, and he was uh, wearing Gucci loafers when in the 40s and 30s. And so I think he was always impeccably dressed, whether he was going out in the evening or on his tractor. So I was always aware. And was your mother very glamorous? She was, and she still is. I mean, she looks amazing. She's 80 years old. You would never know it. She's out reading every magazine, British Vogue, all the time, and she's, she's on top of everything. Is she? Yes. And so, um, so you weren't interested in fashion at all, and, but you did, you did go into marketing. I mean, I think what's interesting about your career is you came at it from a very different angle from Angela Manolo, is that, you know, you worked for Vera Wang as a PR, and you worked for Loewe as a PR. So do you think... Do you think coming at fashion that way, I mean, did you decide to go into marketing and PR because you were interested in fashion or was it just a job that you fell into? How did that come about? I, w I was really interested in art and I was an art history major and worked at Christie's in the summers. But then um, my mother wore a designer called Zorin. Oh, yes. And so I called him and I was at Penn and I sa he said I could start, but I had to move up to New York in a week. And so I graduated and that was when I started working in fashion and really fell in love with it. And, and Zorin was the minimalist, yeah, as you know, incredible. an incredible designer. So I think every job I, I had had a, a has taught me a lot and it maybe it wasn't the perfect job but at Vera I learned a lot about branding and Ralph Lauren I learned a lot about branding with Narciso is I, I was really looking at his precision and tailoring so even though I was in PR and marketing I was really immersed in the brands. Right but did you feel that you had to have a career or were you you know, did you think I'll get married, have children, or...? I, I knew I wanted a career, and did I you? think when I, when I was working at Loewe, I got pregnant with my third son, and that's when I realized I couldn't have the career I was having and be a mom and do both well. So oh, I took off three and a half years to just be a mom, yes. not just be a mom, but to raise my boys, and it was during that time that I came up with this idea for what I was personally missing in the market. So do you think, then, the idea of Toy Birch, the brand, came from something that you, you spotted that there was a gap in the market because it's very specific, your clothes. I mean, they're not high-priced designer clothes. They're very carefully placed. I mean, did you think 
there isn't something out there for me, and there must be lots of me's. So well, I thought, I, I don't know. I didn't know how it would resonate. I, I had worked out of my apartment for the first two and a half years. We opened downtown on Elizabeth Street in a really out of the way spot to sort of learn what we had. We didn't know, but it was just, I personally felt like I love designer clothes. I couldn't afford to buy designer clothes all the time. So I thought we could really design beautiful things with great detailing and fabrics that didn't cost a fortune. And that right. was, I didn't really know how people would respond to it or not. And did you, I heard that you, your first collection you did, you started that from your apartment in the Pier Hotel. Um, I mean, how did you begin to even kind of, you know, get buyers interested or, I mean, did you make the clothes and then, I mean, how did you just manage to get a collection together it, in the first there, place? There was so much cold calling and a lot of no's and just getting people to come up. I had two racks, I, clothes everywhere, um, a little bit of a design team, three people, and just uh, really just asking people to come up and see it. And that said, our, we opened Fashion Week 2004. It was 10 years ago, this February. Yes. yes. And that opening is really when we announced the collection, and we invited press, out-of-town press, and buyers. And, and that was the beginning. Um, was Robert Burke was there from Bergdorf Goodman at the time, and that was our first account. And did you feel um, that this was going to be part of a huge process. I mean, the, the word lifestyle comes up quite a lot in the interviews that I've read. So did you imagine when you first did your first collection that it would be, I mean, now you do swimwear, sunglasses, scent, uh, makeup. Did you, did you really want to create a lifestyle brand or did you start with dresses or, I mean, how did you think it was going to develop? So I, I hear myself talking about when I started and it's embarrassing because I say I wanted to build a global lifestyle brand because I wanted to start a foundation. And quite honestly, I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea the amount of work it would take. And our first store, it was a retail concept from the beginning and our first store had 12 different categories. So basically I went to different factories and sourced different things of what could come together to form a collection. And it was swim, footwear, uh, everything from the beginning. And then what happened as we saw it start to take traction, we started to really work on the different categories. Right, right. I mean, what, um, what's incredible is in like a couple of years, you're, I, I mean, I think actually the year after you launched your first collection, the company became profitable. How did you finance it in the first place? So we put a small amount in, my ex-husband and I, and then uh, we did one round of financing, but I think it was probably 150 investors. And what I said to them is I said, if you, I was so terrified of taking people's money. So I said, if you want to invest, just be prepared to lose it because I, I just can't take that pressure. So we just got a lot of people to invest a very small amount. And it's, it was exciting that it worked out for, to have them come along. And are you interested in that side? You know, I, it's always fascinating when you talk to designers and quite a lot of the time, what really works in a partnership of a, you know, in a, what works in a successful company is that they have somebody, you know, close to them, like Christopher Kane has his sister, or that, that, did you feel you had a right-hand person, or did you sort of propel yourself and you knew where you were going? I mean, did you, how no, did so you? so I, I'm the CEO and the designer. That said, I would never be able to do it without my team, and, and, I, I think I hire the best possible people, and there are so many people that worked in my apartment from the beginning that are still with me today. My brother's co-president, uh, having him is incredibly um, great on so many levels, but also a woman named Bridget Klein, when she came to interview with me, it was in my apartment, and she was president of Michael Kors at the time. And so they were telling her that she was going to commit career suicide by coming to work with us. She was coming, we had no office, we were going to move into one room. And so she really helped build it with me. And then as we went on, we really hired the team to help support us. I mean, when I read um, research about you, you pack more into uh, a day than I think most of us pack into a year. And there's one thing I read, which was every Friday you take two hours off to flower range. And I was like, no, that no, no. is just not <laughs> That's possible. That's not true. <laughs> has that gone by, that's, has that's the flower ranging what gone by the wayside? Is, no, Fridays when we go out to Southampton, I go to this, the flower market early in the morning, which it opens at six. And um, then we ship them out on the Jitney and I r arrange them at Friday night. Or I, I love flowers, so it, for me it's therapeutic. And it seems a lot that your travels, I mean, when I, look at all the pictures and when I go into your, when I went into your shop, 
it really feels like you, the way you lead your life really has impact on the clothes and the products. Like, it feels that there's, you know, bags for holidays, there's shoes for... It feels like a bit of a sort of one long holiday. I mean, is that very much how you, you know, because you obviously travel a lot, is that how you, you, you know, you use your travel uh, experiences and put them into your clothes? I, I think so they definitely. have that Tra joyous sort of feel? Yeah, I think so. Travel's such an incredible inspiration, and it, I, every collection has some influence of different places we've been, that and art, art and artists and music. So we try to incorporate all of that, but it's really what we're looking for, what we're missing. I have a pretty diverse design team, so it's constant collaboration and, and looking at things um, around the world that inspire us. And how do you, I mean, do you, are you very disciplined about how you divide your time? Because you have three sons, you have stepdaughters, you know, you've got houses. I mean, how do you, do you feel run ragged or do you feel, and now you've got very sort of philanthropic projects, which I know are very important to you, do you feel sort of stretched? I mean, most of us find it quite difficult to put a meal on the table at the end of the day. Do you feel that it's taken over your life in a way that's comfortable or do you feel very stretched as a woman trying to do lots of different things and running this huge company now. I mean, I think it's challenging for sure. Being a mother comes first, and I have three sons and, and three stepdaughters that are very close with. And so I, if I wasn't a great mom, I would not be able to be a great CEO. And so basically I take them to school every morning, and I'm home by 7. Right. And, um, are you? Home by 7? Yeah, mo I mean, not all the time, but mo most of the time. And, and aside from that, the whole day is, is pretty intense. <laughs> and... Um, so what, what do you think's left? I mean, how do you, you know, you've, you've designed pretty much, you know, everything that you can design. What, what do you feel you haven't done? What do you... I, mean, I feel like we're just starting. I really, really? do. It's been 10 years, and I've, I've really learned on the job, we, and my team is really coming together. We're in Europe. We're really starting to just um, move into Europe in, in a bigger way, and some parts of Asia. We just opened a store in Munich. You've got over 100 shops. Well, you set out to do that, and you've done that. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. And, I, and also building the foundation is something that's really important. We support women in business and entrepreneurship. So. And are you, you're very involved with that? I'm very involved with in that. How do you actively do that? I mean, how do you... So we, it was part of the business plan uh, when we started the company. And now what we do is we have the executive director as part of our management team. So it's really infused into the company. It's part of the DNA. And, right. and what I never realized is that it's great for business. And it's attracting incredible people to work with us. It's great for our employees. And it's also great for the consumer. Right, right. And would you have any advice for young people starting out now? I would say do it, but you have to have a unique idea and also the wherewithal to understand it's going to be a tremendous amount of work. And yeah. it's been an incredible amount of work, but it's just so fulfilling. So if they have an idea, I'm truly supportive of that. Well, I think you sound like a phenomenon. <laughs> um, so we're going to move on to Angela. Okay. Angela completely... <laughs> yes, wonderful. Angela grew up in the most incredibly idyllic um, family situation north of Milan in the countryside. I just have to say how Angela's parents met because her mother's sitting in the audience here and it's such a romantic story. Angela's father, Tavia, uh, uh, was running in the Olympics in London and he also designed the Italian tracksuits. He had three machines. And Rosita, Angela's mother, was watching the Olympics, and they got married shortly after. I just think it's a wonderful story. Um, your father, Angela, yes, he had three machines, and your parents really started this incredible business, and it sounded like it, it really grew organically that your parents did something very new, which was this way of weaving that was stripes, and then it went into zigzag. And they built up this incredible company and had all their children. And you, you didn't immediately sort of feel that you felt that you wanted to 
go straight into the company mm -hmm. and start working. You, no, you we had were, your three actually children. Actually, we were really pushed to do other things. Were you encouraged to do other things? It wasn't yeah, I was, no, I was not in college. No, I encouraged. Actually, encouraged? I didn't finish, no, I didn't finish my high school. I never had a graduation from high school. Then now, after having two child, dyslexic children, I've learned why, maybe. But I'm having, I'm getting a, an honorary degree in a month. Really? So I'm... <laughs> What have, <laughs> Angela, what have you studied? What, what's the degree in? It's in fashion at the San Francisco... Oh, so you've been presented with a degree. Yeah. Well, not before time, okay. I think. So, I, <laughs> I mean, you did other things. You, you dabbled in the company when you were 18. You did it just for pocket money, I think. Yeah. Do you, did you feel that your parents actively encouraged you to look elsewhere apart from yeah, their yeah, business? Yeah, absolutely. Always. They, they, we, we grew very free. That's what... That's the mentality of our parents. They were very open. They were, I realized immediately while going to school as a young child that uh, we had a very normal life in a way, but they were very special. They, they were not like the parents of the other children. Did you feel that they school. were glamorous or hmm? did you just feel they were incredibly talented and hardworking? No, they parents? were talented. They were <coughs> open. There were many different friends from many different fields coming to the house, being with us from, from the sports field, from uh, any kind of arts, art, uh, yes. artist, um, painter, or uh, theater people, or journalists, politics journalists, and very mixed uh, background of friends. But did you feel it was privileged? I mean, did you feel how lucky you were growing up? Oh, yes, yes, also because uh, uh, at the time, okay, you grow in, so it's natural, right? So you don't realize, and the name was not the name that is today, so we grew while the name was growing. And, uh, but I realized already, because being home and work, the same thing for my mother also, and I was the last one, so they, they started to travel, they started to come to London, New York, Paris, so not to leave me at home, they would take me with them. And I realized that that was not the life of my companion, yes. right? That I was yes. sure, yeah. But that made me somebody who was always there. I was there the first show at five years old. Yes. I was there. It was in your DNA. I met, <laughs> I met him in, <laughs> when I was maybe 10 years old, 12 years old. Uh, I met everybody and I was always there. <laughs> And I love the story of um, uh, you, you wanted to get married, you became pregnant and you wanted to get married, and your mm -hmm. mother said, why are you getting married? It's so conventional. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, she, is... said, she said exactly, she said, in 1982, <clears throat> why do you need to get married? That's what she said. <laughs> so you had your children and you, you kind of took time off. Were you, were you concentrating on being a mother and that was... Quite I a was happy really, time for you. I was driven. <coughs> I think I was driven for maternity. It was my really first thing. And then, uh, so it was, and even while I was pregnant the first time, I was in and out the factory, but then I was like planning every, and, and yet doing things for the well being of my children. Like I open a children's playground. Yes. When I was pregnant, Margarita. <coughs> then when I was pregnant, with Francesco, I did the plan for an organic chicken farm 30 years ago. Was kind so of were you doing fuck, everything doing, but yeah. working for the business? Then, when I was pregnant of Therese, I went to my father and say, I don't know why. I rarely went to my father to tell him things, but when there was a very important moment, I used to go to my dad. Okay, and said, uh, you know, I decided this is not my place, this is not my job, I'm not going to work here because I want to do other things. And then he said, what would you like to do? And I said, I think I'm going to design jewel. And he said, but you know what, this company, it's like a big hat. If you had a creative project, you can do it under this hat. And uh, there's no need for you to work with you your mom that? You every single day. <laughs> and you didn't get that sense before that it was a possibility that you no, could? No, I haven't seen it because, of course, she was doing the collection. They were doing their job. That was their thing. And then uh, probably he was working with my mom since many, many years, and he knew how strong and opinionated she is and uh, so he was suggesting if you want to take some uh, you need to to prove yourself another but side did you at next that time feel that maybe that you 
wouldn't be up to it that your mother was so so creative and so influential <coughs> that you couldn't match up to that or it no, just No, I didn't that. realize. I mean, for me I had a good relation with my mom, but I didn't <coughs> I haven't didn't solve the problem, but he solved the problem. <laughs> your father once said, problem. and I love this. The um, problem, not a problem, but uh, no, but a challenge. The, fact, the a challenge, challenge, exactly. Challenge. Yeah. Your father once said that success, no matter what, is a question of competition, perhaps uh. with oneself. <laughs> and I thought that was, uh, you know, it sounded like the struggle with you of not, you know, quite wanting to say, yeah. I really want to do it, was then, that, you know, and, and that you it know, is a struggle. Yeah. It is a competition with oneself. That drive and ambition is something that, you know, you have to find within but, yourself. And then... And then years after, okay, so I started to follow for license, few licensee, for, of course, the first thing, a children line. And then uh, I went into accessory, other things, and then I realized after three, four years, yes, I wanted to do fashion. Mm. So I started <coughs> my own line. And that it had to be solid in shapes, no pattern. And then after three seasons, I started adding a little pattern here and there. And my mom was really, I could see that she was always surprised that I could handle myself a fashion show. And she was like, and after that collection, she came over and she said uh, that she really liked that the, what I was doing. And uh, if I have a thought of doing the main line, and I said, not really, because honestly, I never had, had you never thought, thought of that. Because that was her job. <coughs> and, uh, and she said, I think you should because uh, I'm tired. I'm tired to fight with the commercial side. <laughs> and you have to do fashion when you're young, you're passionate, <laughs> and you have the strength to fight with the commercial people. <laughs> and did you, did you feel ready for that, Angela? Because you had dipped your toe into I, other waters, you felt ready to take that on? I mean, I the didn't pressure either. It came kind of natural. I started so for a couple, two, three seasons, I started helping the editing, I started looking after the, um, the campaign. That's when I hired Mario Testino I know, and I Karine at the time, 1995. Yes. Yeah. I mean, what was incredible, I think, yeah. uh, reading about you and knowing you as I do, is that, you know, when you took over, you did so many kind of quite breakthrough things. I mean, you were the first person to use you know, Matt Marcus, you've used Jürgen Teller, you've used Mario Testino. You were very, it seemed like even though, you know, you were slightly more hesitant about coming into the company, once you were in the company and heading up the design, that you absolutely ran with it, that you had a vision for it that wasn't necessarily your parents' vision. You were so respectful of their vision. But you really took a lot of chances, and that takes a lot of confidence, I think. I guess uh, that's what I'm, <coughs> I'm saying. I think I've, I have big shoulder because yes. they were asking me if I, how did I feel with the responsibility? I said, either I'm totally unconscious and I don't <laughs> feel it, or I just felt confident probably. And uh, I just had so much enthusiasm for what I was doing. And I must say that I've always been very much supported by my parents, yes. really. Yes. And um, I don't know. I don't know how I did. I, what I know at the beginning, because now we must say it's almost uh, 19, 18 years. So whatever you know about me, Sony, maybe it's what I've yes. done in the past year. But uh, I think that I've never was scared because whatever they did, and I was there, as I told you before, I was there. I know Miss Sony by heart and what they did, everything. So they were not only a zigzag, they were yes. um, a world to me. Oh, uh, sure. Prince and whatever, I mean, knits, of course, but and color and pattern, but they were a whole world. So yes. I, would have, I was never scared to add new ideas and to new ideas, and which I think it. they're like new words that I, because they really invented the vocabulary yeah, and I'm like yeah. updating that lexicon of that vocabulary. But did that you that feel language. that was very important? I mean, did you feel Masoni is so recognizable? I mean, one of the most recognizable brands in the world, mm. I think. Um, did you feel that you wanted to change it or can, do you feel that you nudge it on almost organically? No, the first thing I did actually, I was feeling like if I had to fix it. 
because really? I could see because I could see in the collection at the time there were always seeds of new things, but they were submerged by the history right, of Missouri. Yes. So what it was almost the, the, like a burden. Exactly. It could be a burden. So what I did at the beginning was really no, okay. What's about Missoni? So, okay, this season, we go with the stripe, we go with the stripe, and we pull out the, the, the thing. And of course, I wanted to wear those clothes, and I wanted my mm. girlfriend to wear mm. those clothes. And uh, so I just tried to make clothes that I wanted to wear. It and now with your daughter being simple. so um, representative of the company and mm -hmm. so involved, she does the. Yes, bags. I was lucky. She was not the project, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, do you feel. You don't feel yet you're at your mother's stage of handing over to her. You're still very, very enthusiastic. You, that, I mean, you reinvent it every season, and it feels completely natural what you do. So you're, you're, you're feeling that there's still lots more that you can do with Missoni. No, I feel there's lots of more things that I need to be fixed in the company. That's yes, <laughs> not only on the style side. Because uh, sometimes working in an old company is not, uh, it's yes. not easy to open a new company, but to work in an old company, it's not that easy yes. either, It has its right? challenges. And very challenging. Yes. But I would be more than happy if uh, my daughter, both. I don't know why the fashion goes through the women in this yes. Missoni fashion yes. house, yes. but it really was my mother, the fashion, the passion for fashion. My father was more of an artist and uh, my brother was never really involved in fashion. Maybe I have a nephew that really likes a uh, boy for the first time. Maybe we're going to see. But, yes. uh, well, but let's, basically let's it goes through the girls. Uh, yes. And my daughters are very interested and uh, but Margarita now she's in the face of being a mother too, right? Yes. So <laughs> she's going to take some time off too. But wonderful <laughs> to pass on the lessons that you learned to your daughter. Angela, thank you. No, thank you. Um, I love this. Uh, in Sex in the City, when Carrie was mugged on the street, she said, take anything, but don't take my Manolos. <laughs> Manolos also be mentioned in every single episode of Ab Fab. I think that's pretty that incredible. Great and designed Kate Moss's wedding shoes. Mm. So Manola, you're, you grew up in the Canary Islands and uh, you said there was nothing on a banana plantation that your, was part of your mother's uh, family. Your father looks beautiful, your mother looks beautiful. You. Um, you've said that there was only you, sun, sea and sand and bananas. But it was no cultural backwater, was it? I mean, you had incredible well, visitors, and well, it sounded very exotic. Let me tell you, um, being an islander has got an incredible challenge. Challenges at the time, mm -hmm. because it was after the war, the, the mm -hmm. 1945 war. So we didn't have much um, in the sense of um, figures, visiting figures of culture. Or, yes, we did have every season a theatrical company from Madrid, or or a singer or somebody like that. Were you desperate when, uh, when they came? Desperate well, for I'm culture? Well, I'm starting to, starting to be like the beginning of the 50s as I was like a child, so... Um, you cannot explain how you, uh, you just absorb the mm. culture of those things because it was totally, I was totally isolated. And my mother was also was the instrument, my mother more than my father. My father was a tennis man, so he was all the time playing tennis. So uh, <laughs> this is true. Um, and, um, but your mother sounds amazing because she asked the local cobbler oh, to yes. tell her how to, yes, how to, do, how to things, do the rudiments yes. of shoes. So genetically, genetically inherit. So this kind of shoe nonsense, yes. So what were you like as a child, Manolo? Because Manolo is so distinctive and eccentric. And I mean, were you like that as a child? Uh, I think I was Carving exactly, your own way? I think I was always the same, even worse. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, but you know, but you see, this is, is something will come to me now. It's such a, um, when you feel, talk about this island feeling, it's like my grandmother's house come to, to, to in front of me and I say, how very fortunate we were to have this incredible playground, the most beautiful garden, which is very, I'm going to say that, reminds me um, um, 
the childhood of Lampedusa, mm -hmm. the uh, Principe Lampedusa, mm -hmm. the counterpart, the, the leopard, which um, is the most beautiful images that you can sort of re recall from that period. It was through my own experience, which a different setting, different sort of, you know, these people just like aristocracy from the Sicilian, whatever. 12th century, and we were just like kind of islanders, and my grandfather had just nothing but bananas, so this is what you talk about culture, uh, in the sense how yes, I did go to you, culture. But, you, but, but your early interest, I mean, you loved films oh. and reading from a very, very early age. My mother you know, was you, the one. But you soaked it up, I mean, you, yes. you know, you educated yourself in a way, in mm, that sense, do you think? I guess was my mother's words. Can, can you imagine? I was reading Marie Antoinette by Stefan Zweig when I was, my, my mother was reading us when I was eight and nine. My sister falls asleep immediately. I was, oh, more, more, more. She always stopped uh, when Marie Antoinette was a uh, conciergerie because it was too disagreeable. But um, I was reading. Uh, but also. they were glamorous, your parents. I mean, your mother ordered clothes in from Paris yes, and from Madrid. Paris. From Madrid. Madrid. From Madrid. 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 Paris was offhand, right. off, too far away and too expensive. And then I read, Maloney, that you used to make shoes for the lizards in silver foil and put ribbons Indeed. on them. Indeed, lizard and lizards. my poor dog also was a victim <laughs> of my silver foil, yes. So when you were, <laughs> so when you were um, young, you went to study in Geneva, you thought you might be a lawyer. They kicked me out to Ge kicked uh, from the out. islands to Geneva. Because my uncle was... And they separated you and your sister, because yes, you were very close because it was with like Evangelina. Too difficult, uh, yes. Um, I was in Geneva for many, many years, and uh, I, my second language was French. Yes. So this is what happened when I arrived to Geneva. I said, my God, I, I miss an incredible amount of things that all the older children have, which is mm. culture, mm. and incredible culture. So I study even worse, more than, yes. than the other people. You were sort of to, voracious to, to learn. To just like, you're voracious, so exactly well. Mm. And uh, I guess it was like, I mean, in two or three years, I was exactly the same like everybody else. And it seemed like your parents, your father was very um, indulgent, you know, when you said you didn't want to be a lawyer, uh, oh. that they were fine. You went to Paris, yes. and then I your aunt to, was incredible yes. well, at teaching my, my, you lots my, my of... My auntie, uh, Federica, was wonderful. She took me to, 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 to this extraordinary conference, uh, all the new things that happened in Geneva, and she said, oh, you know, um, in Paris, they're going to be playing um, um, Dommage que soit un putain. Peter, she's a whore. And uh, he, she told me, and with two friends of mine, we took a deux chevaux, um, a car, mm. and we traveled all night, and we went to see Romy Schneider and Alain Delon, directed by a great Visconti. Mm. And, uh, and I never sort of could shake that those images yes. out of my system. Yes, so very, very visual. Perfection, yes. perfection for me, and still, it still I'm is, affected isn't it? by, by, yes. by it. And then you, you went to London, but you thought that you might be a theatre designer. I wanted then. You wanted uh, to be a theatre designer. I had the pretensions of, yes, film and theatre designer. And I have a few friends in London, which they encouraged me. Yes. But I thought, I'm not very good with people. Uh, sharing with, with, with kind of, you know, collaborations. collaborations. No, oh, I hated it. I could, not a shower. I was very, very impressed by Miss Birch saying that you've got a team of people. I cannot work with a team. <laughs> I just need, I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, absolutely impossible for me. So I do everything myself. But then I think uh, it's true. And if it's wrong, it's wrong. He if it's bad. He calves the heels himself. <laughs> um, he really does. Um, but then what sounds so interesting is reading about you, it's people that really shaped your life. That, you know, you didn't, you weren't particularly connected, you didn't see no. those people, but they fell into your life, like Prima Picasso, Ozzy Clark, um, incredible kind of legends. Ah. And they took, I think it was Prima Picasso, took you to New York. No, and Eric, you met Eric Bauman and Delama went together to yes, New York. Because and we you met. were working in a jeans yes. company, you were, you were working in Bernstein, shops, yes. uh, doing the PR selling. with selling. Can you imagine Manolo selling imagine, a pair of I, jeans? I six months, but I have a green card and I was happy. At yes. the time you need to be in England, a green card. So but how did you taken. meet, I mean, I'm so fascinated, but by, you know, you gathered around... I mean, I think you met Eric Bowman because you saw him crossing the street and he looked no, fabulous and you were trying to do a theatre. How wonderful you dress, met, yeah. You met these people 
almost by chance and they really shaped... Actually, my choice, shaped. in fact, because, I mean, well, some of them is this, but I am a spontaneous person. Yes. So, yes. Um, uh, you know, already this, this beginning of, in England, so I thought, these people of fashion are kind of exotic. Why not? And I started to say, well, I mean, I'm, I'm much better than some of those people that are doing those things that I'm seeing here, who just pushed in the press. And um, I started thinking about this germinating in my mind. So... Um, I knew Eric, I knew Paramount, everything. But the beginning was like I went to see people, like in England, I went to see Miss Miller, God bless her, and uh, Grace Coddington. And, um, but Manila, before that, you had gone to New York on ah, a holiday. Before that, I was there, oh and, God, and you saw yes, Diana Vreeland. Mrs. Vreeland was the. And you saw her with your theatre designs, and she yes. said, forget about the theatre, the things that you're doing from ground up are so much more true, interesting. So true. that was a really. Did that was sort an of, incredible that was sort an incredible of privilege. Uh, yes. Uh, and you know and that really so opened the doors for me in the sense that I wouldn't have been able to. Have you even thought of that? Do you think? Mm. Yes, I think, and I never thought of like sort of conscious, no. but it happened. You know, yes. the, the things yes. happened. And years later, when Mrs. Willem was getting really not able to see, and I was given this award in fashion design for America. Manolo's had thirty awards, by the way. Thirty. <laughs> I don't even know which one. It's a lot. I don't even know that. But anyway, so, um, would you read that? Yes, I okay. yes, counted yeah. them. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> Mrs. Rilland did, did open the door for me, and she was such a divine woman. And again, 20 years later, they was given this award. I don't remember the dates, but um, she gave me this, they gave me this award in America. And the first thing I have in the telephone was Mrs. Rilland. Oh, I'm so happy to just got this. Then I sent flowers to her, and she was completely blind. She said, the flowers are beautiful. The red color is marvelous. I mean, you know, this kind of uh, yes. divine woman. Yes. She was imp I was so impressed. The first time I met her, was, I couldn't even say a word. Well, I, I, was I, I know that feeling. And I was but ridiculous. With, um, but your first sort of break was that Ozzy, you met Ozzy Clark, and he asked you to make shows for his... I met shoes for his show, and they, they were rubber, Indeed. and there was a technical hitch. And that would, could, be, could have been the dead of my career and as a designer. And that was in the 70s, but it wasn't. But it was fantastic. It wasn't. Because, I mean, no, even people like David and Cecil Beach and say, oh, those were girls work, walk strangely, very sensuous. I said, so what? <laughs> and I was, I was like there in the public, absolutely fainting of terror. Because I saw how bad it was. <laughs> and, and then, Manola, what happened was, which I think is really interesting, is that because I remember this shop, I remember Zapata. My God. Yes, and you oh. worked as a sales assistant there, oh and then God. you bought bought it with a loan from the bank for two thousand pounds. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> and then you paid it off within a year. Yes, yes, yes. I did. And then because you had your shoe shop, uh, where it remains you know, to this day. Another, another sort of casual, another kind of, you know things that happened to me. I never want anything. Because you borrowed that money from the bank. Indeed. Yes. By the time you could. Yes. By the time they didn't say how much collateral you have <laughs> or how much... You know, so you could buy. But did you feel, Manila, that, that that was your path? As soon as Diana Vreeland said, do it, you know, the things on the ground are, are, are wonderful, did you immediately I think, yes, to, of course, that's what I should to, be doing? I started to work in my mind saying, maybe what she says is true because I never believe it, so... Mm. But, you know, that influenced me. Incredible. And then you've gone on. I mean, Ozzy Clark was just the beginning, and Manolo's done so many collaborations with John Galliano and, you know, but, with... But Ozzy was my... my Isaac Mizrahi. Mm, yes, but this is like Ozzy major. Ozzy was in 1972. Do you enjoy those collaborations, Manolo? Because when you because say you're on your like, own, but do you um, enjoy the process of working yes, with I people? Yes, I did, because that was... Um, he encapsulated what England was about for me. Yes. This creativity, this incredible sort of... You know, everything was spontaneous. Everything was like never planned. No. It happened. That was I mean, London in the 70s. Sim it was yes, very simply because he had incredible talent simple. and incredible vision and incredible... Mm. And I met a lot of people like that in England. And I stayed. Yes, and, then, <laughs> and many have remained friends to this day. And yes. But, Manola, you spend a lot of time... Manola lives in a beautiful house in Bath, but you spend so much time in the factory. You carve the heels yourself. You're there like a demon. I know you are. Yes. Do you, like me very I mean, much. You, I read once that you said, the day, the day I'll give up is when I'm bored, and when do I have time to be bored? 
You yeah. don't seem ever oh. to be bored of what you're doing, and you've done it for so long, and yeah. it's so... You reinvent everything, so... It seems so spontaneously yeah. and so naturally. Are you still as excited today as you are when I you I think I'm even, even worse, because... <laughs> I tell you why, because somehow... Um, I never felt this kind of boredom when I do something. Uh, maybe when I, I, I'm going to drop dead doing things, because, I mean, you know... Do you ever relax, Manolo? I wish I could, no. Is it no. almost like a neurosis? Mind you, I just now I have a new uh, toy, which is like seeing movies like in Netflix and things like that, which is like, I mean, yes, I tell you, it's like so addictive. It's, so I mean, um, it's the only addiction I have. In fact, you know, I saw... Um, the only addiction you have? I don't think so, would I? Sugar, shoes. Sugar, shoes, shoes, sugar, S, S. Shoes and, and films. Sugar and shoes. And, um, and um, no, and now I re realize that I really um, I don't like TV very much. No. But you what TV films. has produced, because TV you have to see those awful ads and things like that, and people talk about that. But Netflix but, is the um, way to go. But I want to see, boom, the yeah. whole thing in one go. You want lockdown, yes. lock in, yes. Yes. the whole series. That's it, the whole thing. Impulsively. I mean, I saw the end of, I wouldn't tell you, but um, the House of Cards is fantastic. Oh, yes. And I can. <laughs> I completely agree. And I can wait for completely the next agree. one now. Um, that's wonderful. No, just, just all, the, all such different stories, and I think it's just amazing that, you know, that you're all here and such a success in so many different ways. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor, so anybody, any questions? And Manalo, yeah. Um, Tori, British Vogue recently on their Facebook page put a quote up by you saying, I believe you can have it all, you just have to know it's going to work. I just wondered what, how you define having it all. I don't remember saying that, actually. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I, I think having it all is really personal, and you have to decide what having it all means to you. For me, it's happy children and loving what I do. Actually, I had a question for Tori as well. Um, I'm a Philly girl as well, Elkins Park. Um, <laughs> my question was, I, I, when I, I used to work for Nordstrom, had a great career there, and that's when I first learned about Tori Birch. And I see it as the Hamptons kind of girl, a new Americana, like beyond Ralph Lauren, Michael Kors. But now I'm seeing it like all over the world. And I guess my question is, what do you do to kind of think about women outside of the states do you incorporate anything like i see it you know i saw women in istanbul wearing your flats you see your bags you know in china like do you think about any of the other cultures when you're designing no we do i would say most collections are inspired by women and we're, we're very proud to be an american brand but it's really about women around the world that are inspiring to us so I travel a, a great deal and, and, and really see what women are wearing and, be, and I'm, I'm inspired by that. Uh, in the Middle East, we, we make things that are slightly more covered up. They're longer, uh, longer sleeves. In Brazil, we, we're, we're learning as we go and we want to be respectful to local cultures and customs and, and really understand what women want as, as we move there. When, when we first went into Brazil, our bikinis were far too big and they, <laughs> there was, it was really a problem. So we had to really um, do that. In Asia, we have an Asian fit for eyewear. So um, as, as we grow, we're learning and, and we really hope to learn more. Hi there, this is a question for all of you. Um, what advice would you give someone like me um, who's trying to launch a very unique and new product into the fashion industry um, when you're faced with so many people that don't want to take risks and that are you know, in the economic climate at the moment um, the, where it's quite difficult to sort of get yourself out there? Uh, did I get it well? She wanted. She has a line. She's yes. launching a line, yes. right? Okay, go. No, you, you can go. Um. <laughs> Both of you, Angela, you go first. No. You do, you, okay, you I first. do think that 
Today there is a big chance uh, which is communication and it's uh, internet basically and uh, and if you have if you really have something to say you can really be heard mm. Mm. so i think if you really work well your project of communication through the web uh, you can be heard everywhere and then build of course the business side uh, next to it but uh, you can gain uh, visibility much more easily than uh, even though you're Everybody's battling toward the big, strong brands because and they're advertising. But that's the chance of today, the web, really. Manolo, what advice would you give somebody? Well, to first of all, you have to have this incredible passion, this incredible obsession about what you do and mm, believe in what you course. do. Because, I mean, it's, I agree with Angela, for instance, that the internet is an incredible platform. Open, yes, a platform. Mm. But if what you do is not, um, somebody else is going to see that it's not true. Mm. So it's yeah, going to be, um, at the same time, double. Right. Double, what do you call it? Right. Mm. Double side. Mm. Yes, two edge. You have something. Two edge. You have something. Talent. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I don't know. If it's that what you want. Hi, my question yeah. is from Manolo. Um, I'm just wondering when it comes to designing shoes. Uh, when does comfort and style overlap in the sense of the height of the shoe and how comfortable that would be when you're wearing it? Melinda, can I vouch for mine? It's like wearing a pair of bedrooms Ugh. on my feet and they are so comfortable. It's Comfort's paramount important to, you. To, yeah. to, to have um, comfort. Without, without comfort, I would not be here or selling mm -hmm. shoes. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a combination between the look of it, um, the quality of it, and how you can walk. Otherwise, it's just no point. Is that it? Is that mm. answering you? And, uh, <laughs> and I tell, can tell you, you are more comfortable in your high heels if you're skinny, because the weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, no, it's, it's no, no. true. <laughs> it's true. I mean, uh, it's That's true. A challenge, the weight on your feet. It's a. Uh, Bit of a problem, right? You know. It's true. Is that why you don't, that's why my mother used to tell me that them. exactly. Yeah, I'm out. I, I, cannot walk, <laughs> I cannot walk in flat shoes. <laughs> yep. Hi, uh, my question is also for Manolo. I just wanted to ask you do you have a specific woman when you design your shoes or you just go crazy with your imagination? <laughs> you know something? I love any kind of women. Short, tall, I like tall, tall, tall. But um, um, no, I don't, I don't have a special idea. Sometimes when I'm a little bit creative, I think maybe let's gonna do some kind of shoes that um, a bourgeois woman in Madrid gonna walk in the theater or a girl in New York or in San Francisco. Yes, you have moments that you think about certain women. But no, I think about it, you know, women. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. The question is for Manolo Blanik. I wanted to ask about your sketching. Do you usually do the sketches and then provide them to technical people to do the fitting and the technical drawing, or do you do the technical no, drawing? No, 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 no. I do everything. You I do, do the, the sketch, technical. I do the, the sample, I do the thing, I try the shoes, and the technical <laughs> side goes, yes. I do everything. Even the technical yes. part. Okay. But you know, but this is what I say. Um, I'm surprised that people have teams. I don't understand. I cannot work. Because, this. <laughs> because for me, I it's great. It's a great achievement that I can work that out. I can't. Because I was in Vigevano, and uh, a lot of the factories there were telling me that I need to. They can do the patterns for me. So I just was wondering. You have to cut the pattern. Yes. As yes. soon as we have the idea, you have the chemise or like non so come like a mise. Uh, the plastic, the last. The, 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 the last, of course, at yeah. first. But then you have, on top of the last, you have paper, plastic, or whatever. And then you draw the thing there. Yeah. The only thing I don't do, because I hate numbers, is sizing. I hate to do the sizes of the shoes, and uh, I don't do that. Grading, OK. Very Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Tori, Angela, and Manolo.